We'll now look at graphing trigonometric functions and seeing how to change them for different types of applications. Generally speaking, the graphs of sine and cos functions look pretty much the same. They all have this sort of sinusoidal sort of shape to them. But depending on certain various parameters, this sort of shape can be stretched or squished or pulled or shrunk in vertical direction as well. And it can also be moved along the axis in a shifting kind of way as we've spoken about before in composite functions. So we're going to be looking at graphs of the more general trig functions, a sine bx plus c, and a cos bx plus c, and look at what these a, b, and c parameters can do to the shape and the position of the, of the graph. So as we've said, sine and cosine curves will share the same shape, but we're going to look at multipliers and changes to the argument that will shift it, squish it, and pull it. In this graph on the left here, we have two curves shown. The blue curve, this one here, shows us the graph of y equal to sine x. On the other hand, the red dashed curve shows the graph of cos x. And you can see that they both have the same standard sort of shape. It's just that the sine curve and the cos curve are shifted across the axis by, a, by an amount. What you might also notice is that they all cross the axis at multiples of pi well, half multiples of pi anyway. So we cross at 0, pi on 2, pi, 3 pi on 2, and the same back in the other direction. And this continues as far as you move along. That's just where the crossover points or the x-intercepts for those curves are. We'll refer to these as the standard shape for a sine or cosine curve. And what we're going to look at is figuring out, how, figuring out how we can change these when we have things like a multiplier a out the front of a sine curve or cos curve, and when the argument, instead of just being x, is something like a bx plus c, where b and c can be real numbers as well. We'll find that a, b and c are going to shift the graph up and down, left and right, and squish it and squeeze it, and pull it and stretch it in different directions. There are various ways to graph these trig functions, but the way I'm going to show you uses that standard curve. Essentially, I just draw the standard curve itself first of all, I draw in a horizontal axis, but not a vertical axis just yet. I also don't put in any values or tick marks along that horizontal axis. Before we do that, we're going to want to know some information about our particular curve, a sine bx plus c or a cos bx plus c. And the information we're going to look for is the amplitude, the wavelength, and the position or phase shift of the curve. Once we know all of that information, we can fill in the vertical axis in the correct place and also label the tick marks along the horizontal axis so that we know exactly where and which curve we're talking about. So the amplitude just tells us about how high or how far away from the axis, essentially, the curve or the sine function will go. For the functions that we're talking about, these ones here, this basically means how high is this value here? How high above the, the horizontal axis is the highest point of our curve? And when it comes to the function written in mathematical form, that answer is given by the value of a. It's the multiplier of the sine or the cos curve. Now we do need to be a little bit careful because sometimes you'll have actually have a negative value at the front. So what I'm going to do is put some absolute value signs around that. And that'll just give us the correct value for the amplitude. But basically a negative or a positive is just going to flip the curve upside down compared with the positive or negative version. The wavelength of the function is governed by the b parameter. In fact, the wavelength is equal to 2 pi divided by the value b. And that tells us how far it is between repeating values of the curve. So essentially this distance in here. You can think about it as the wavelength of waves at c or other types of waves you might be familiar with. The standard position, this is kind of a, a reference to if we're looking at the x equals 0 value of the function. For sine, that value is 0, 0. The standard position for cos is x equals 0 and the function value equal to 1. So the standard position is generally given as 0, 0 or 0, 1, depending on if we're talking about a sine curve or a cosine curve. The phase shift of the function tells us about where the, cu the curve is moved left or right compared with the standard graphs from the previous slide. And it's always given by c on b to the right. 
So we calculate the value of C on B, and then we move the standard position that far to the right hand side. Now that's a lot of stuff all at once. So let's see if we can make that a bit more concrete by looking at an example. Here we're going to sketch the curve y equal to 3 multiplied by sine of 2 pi t plus pi on 2. Now just be careful here and remember that this is a function of t, not x. So our independent variable, horizontal axis variable, is a t. And we're going to use that in our graph. Have a pause for a moment now and see if you can write down the amplitude, the period, the phase shift and the standard position for this curve. Okay, so the way to do this is just to identify from the function that a is 3, b is 2 pi, and c is pi on 2. That'll then, then let us write down that the amplitude is also 3, the absolute value of 3. The period, or the wavelength of the function, is going to be 2 pi divided by 2 pi, because b is 2 pi, so that's just 1. The phase shift is going to be 1 on 4 to the right, and the standard position, because this is a sine curve, would be a 0, 0 crossover. So now we can use this information to form our curve and our graph of our curve. Pause the video now if you like and have a go at that yourself. So the first thing I've done is set up a pair of axes, the y-axis for our function values and the t-axis for our independent variable values. I also know that because the phase shift is one quarter to the right from the standard position of 0, 0, and because the period or wavelength is 1, I know that I'm going to need some tick marks like 1 on 4, because that's where our standard position is moving to, and also things like 5 on 4, and back in multiples of a quarter as well, because those are when it, where my key points in the graph are, the ones that where it crosses the axis. I also need, know that I need to go up to 3 and down to minus 3, because the amplitude of the curve here is 3, uh, which is different from the standard where it's just 1. So we can start to fill things in now. I know that the standard position, 0, 0, in the standard sine curve has moved across by one quarter to the right. So I know that my curve is going to cross at zero, uh, sorry, at a quarter zero. I have a period or wavelength of one, so I know that the gra graph is going to repeat itself one unit along the axis. It'll do the same back one unit. Just like the standard curve, I know that halfway in between each of these points will also have an x-intercept, so I can fill those in as well. And finally, in between each of those, I know that we'll be reaching the maximum or the minimum values of the function. I just need to know whether it's going to be a maximum or a minimum. Now in this case, with a sine curve, sine curves normally go up from the origin, the standard position. With the standard position moved across to the right, our function is now going to go up to 3, at x equals a half, back down through the, uh, through the axis, and down to minus 3, at x equals 1. Similarly, moving backwards, we'll go down to minus 3 at x equals 0, up through the intercept point, all the way up to 3 at minus a half, and back down again. Now at this point, it's just a matter of filling in the standard shape for the sine curve, and we're pretty much done. So we can do that by joining up all the dots with a sine-shaped curve. And there we are. So that's our graph of y equal to 3 sine of 2 pi t plus pi on 2. It's got a different amplitude, a different wavelength, a phase shift to the right, and that changes the way the graph looks compared with the standard curve. Essentially the shape is the same, we've just had to change what we've got on our axes and where the axes sit. So that's how it works for shifted and changed sine and cos functions. There are, of course, other trigonometric functions as well, tan, sec, cosec, and cotangent. These have graphs roughly of these shapes here. These are the standard curves for those. We won't be looking into how to shift and change those, but similar kind of arguments can be used to do so. Generally, though, you might just want to go straight to your computer algebra system or some sort of graph graphing computer program. Okay, to finish this one off, have a play around with either Google or Wolfram Alpha or maybe, maybe even your calculator and sketch some different trig functions with different amplitudes, wavelengths and phase shifts and see what happens. See how it changes the shape and the moves the positions around on the axes. If you want to extend things a little bit, have a look at what happens if you multiply that function 
by a linear function or even an exponential function. How does that change what you get? When you finish playing around with that, have a go at the worksheet problems for the video. And as usual, make sure you're writing down in your notebook any questions that you might need to figure out or ask someone. And even better still, make sure you do ask someone about those questions and get them fixed up.